Welcome to the Grim Leftover Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, uh, yeah, folks, it's Monday night right now here, Monday evening, I guess, on this November 25th, 2019. I am Grimnir, and this is the Grim Leftovers program right here on reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, and a host of other places that the audio stream goes out to. So uh, howdy and welcome to all you folks out there in the ether or here in the chat room on reallibertymedia.com, which is actually on irc.freenode.net. we got a great group of folks here, we always do. Oh, yeah, let me just tell you who I see in here talking it up, chatting it up right now. I see Mr. Vin A, Vin E, uh, wonderful Miss Kate Da, yeah, Da, <laughs> Mr. Meisterbrow, the woodman. Uh, Miss uh, Moose is around somewhere, I'm pretty sure, hanging out with us. She said she was going to be tuning in anyway. I talked to her shortly ago. We got the Java Doctor and, uh, I, I don't know, Beetle. Oh, Beetle, hey, Beetle, you tuned in? Bop that, bop that beetle. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of other folks in here, but but I don't see them actively chatting at this point in time. Doesn't mean they're not here. Uh, Goober, I see Goober popping in, popping out. I left him some funny stuff earlier today. Oh boy, it's uh, it's it's more spring-like this week than it was last week. Last week, it, I mean, not spring-like, fall-like. <laughs> I'm only half half a year off. Uh, but uh, last week it was more winter-like. So. We go from from summer, fall, winter, fall, back to fall. Whichever, man, it's cool. We're up. I'm up here in uh, central New Mexico, so uh, that's how things go. Anyway, I got a bunch of stories lined up for you. Hopefully, you'll enjoy or benefit from some of them. Uh, anyhow, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes for you. Mundy, no, it's not Mundy. <laughs> Vinny, he's from, uh, well, he's from Tulsa, but he's in Oklahoma, and and he he doesn't say day, he says D uh, for the different days: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> it's day, you dang. Oh, <laughs> all right. I don't need to be uh, don't need to be commenting on that during the show here. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, I got a whole bunch of stories lined up here for you. Let's go with, let's get going on some of them here right now. Uh, kicking it off on SputnikNews.com. Sputnik. Oh, Anti's here too. Hey, Anti, how you doing, man? Uh, all right, so here we go. And I don't know how you could do one of these w- without noticing because uh, it, it really, it really, it, it doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, never mind. I, I was laughing at something else that's not important to you people on the radio. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how you could have one of these without noticing, but apparently, according to Sputnik, this is an unnoticed apocalypse. And unnoticed, just having an apocalypse and nobody, nobody even cares or sees it happening. What are they talking about? Dying insects put humankind's existence, your very existence, at risk. Yeah, that's probably not good. This is posted on SputnikNews.com, as I mentioned, on uh, the uh, 13th of November. These are uh, fresher leftovers than some of the previous weeks that I've had, but yeah, fresher leftovers. As my list, my overall list, is shortening. So here we go. The analysis conducted by Professor David Golson of Britain's leading ecologist says that 50% of insects have perished since 1970 as a result uh, habitat, uh, of habitat loss and heavy use of pesticides. Golston Gold Sun notes that the number could be even higher. Now I, I don't oh no, I'm not I'm not a bugologist. <laughs> but uh, but I'm gonna say that every every insect that was born in nineteen seventy is dead now. 
I don't know how long the longest living insect is, but I, that's obviously not what he's talking about. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Anyway, according to this here, a new scientific report warns that if we, you and I, and the rest of the world, don't stop extinction and decline in the population of insects, uh, it would pose catastrophic consequences to all forms of life on Earth. Three quarters of the crop types grown by humans are pollinated by insects. insects. Uh, we would not be able to feed ourselves if they disappear. The research for Wildlife Trusts, which is a part, has a particular focus on the United Kingdom, says 41% of insect species are threatened with extinction. Uh, 23 bee and wasp species have died out in the UK since 1850, uh, while the number of butterflies that specialize in particular habitats have declined by 77%. Uh, the research cites another scientific review conducted by the Australian entomologist who stress humans, you and I, are witnessing the largest extinction event since the late Permian. This unnoticed apocalypse should set alarm signs, alarms ringing. We have put a risk, at risk, some of the fundamental building blocks of life, according to Gary Mantle, chief executive of the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust, the causes of the decline and extinction. Habitat loss caused by land cleared, um, increased use of pesticides, and, uh-oh, not this one, climate change are behind the extinction of the insect species and the decline in their population. Professor Golson said 98% of wildflower meadow, meadows and 50% of ancient woodlands have disappeared, vanished, gone forever in, uh, the, in Britain since 1950. 98%, that's a pretty high percentage. While the use of pesticides has doubled in the last 25 years, even a tiny dose of chemicals can have a nearly lethal effect on insect behavior. With regard to climate change and other fairy tale nonsense, the report shows that the ranges of some insects have started to shift in response to the changes, and there is evidence that some pollinating insects appear at different time than the plants they're supposed to be pollinating. Yes, this does have an impact on all life forms. The research notes that much of the world's attention has been focused on other animals, through in, uh, although insects are far more important to the functioning of ecosystems. With their decline and extinction posing catastrophic consequences to all forms of life, they act as pollinators, food for other species, nutrient cycling, and are responsible for pest control and decomposition. Between 1967 and 2016, the population of the spotted flycatcher, I'm not sure what that is, fell by 93% in Britain. Uh, it really worries me to hear people say we need more long-term studies to be sure. That would be great, but we can't wait another 25 years before we do anything because it will be too late. We have put at risk some of the fundamental building blocks of life, but insects and other invertebrates can recover quickly if we stop killing them and restore the habitats they require to thrive. Uh, the, the report stressed that it is not too late for the international community to address this issue as insect populations can rapidly recover if we introduce significant changes by reducing the use of pesticides, greening cities, whatever that means, and creating an insect-friendly habitat with special focus on farmland, which they don't really want farmland, at least not non-corporate farmland. And corporate farmland is the heaviest user of the most amounts of pesticides. No matter how many gardens we make, wild 
wildlife friendly if 70% of the countryside remains largely hostile to life, then we're not going to turn around the insect decline, uh, said Peter Golson, Professor Golson. Uh, the report noted that every individual can contribute to the rescue process by growing flowers and planting trees and not using pesticides in the garden and by simply not mowing lawns. Hey, not mowing lawns. I'm right with you, buddy. Oh, <laughs> allowing flowers to grow. So the thing is here, um, while he goes on a little bit, just a tad, just a tad about about the uh, global warming nonsense, or what do you call it, climate change nonsense, um, he does point out a lot of good things here, uh, that the massive increase in the use of pesticides, which is done by uh, the big corporate farmers buying out the independent farmers, uh, people not being allowed to or just choosing not to grow their own gardens or uh, over trimming their yards to make it look acceptable to the community, uh, you're, you're doing bad things without realizing it and apparently without noticing it. So uh, Vinny here pu uh, pulled up a thing he spotted flycatcher, which is a small bird, apparently, um, which I, I, he didn't even mention birds there. Not directly, he mentioned all forms of life, which would be birds as well. So uh, anyway, uh, it's the corporate farms. That, that, that's really the big problem. Uh, the corporate farms and the pesticides they choose to use. Uh, that are winding up killing things. Hey, Donna, join us. Hey, Donna. How you doing? Ah, oh, boy. All right. Now, this next article, <laughs> it's, a li it's, it's a bit confusing. I, 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 I've read through it four or five times. And I've actually looked at the actual legislation that they're talking about, uh, the bill uh, that's involved here. And, and I'm pretty sure I know what the guy wanted to do, but the way everything is worded, you know, it, these these legalized, legal, legal folks using their legalized speech, their legal wordings, legalese, uh, uh, really, really makes things very confusing. Uh, but here it is. It's posted on ArsTechnica.com on uh, November 12th. EPA still moving to limit science used to support regulations. There was a draft published uh, by the New York Times which expands on the version started under Scott Pruitt back in 2015 which seems to be a good thing, but they they don't want that. They don't they don't like it. As best I could tell, I could be reading this in reverse. I, I could be reading backwards what they're trying to say because of the way they phrase things. But let me give it to you a little bit here, and maybe you can decipher it better than I can, uh, because it seems like this guy um, wanted to before he retired. Uh, wanted to prevent the EPA from putting out regulations where the science was not publicly available uh, for other people to uh, test the science and make sure it was correct, and that the actual that the, there was actually science there before the EPA imposes regulations against people doing things, uh, basically as favors to corporations that run the EPA. Because, as you all know, all the government agencies are run by various large corporations. And so they push through legislation that would benefit them and screw everybody else over. So here, here it is. Former Texas Congressman Lamar Smith may have retired in January, but his ideas still stalk the halls of the EPA. The New York Times reported Monday of the week this came out that the latest incarnation of Smith's quest to change the science the EPA can use for its rulemaking is moving forward. Smith had unsuccessfully pushed a bill called the Secret Science Reform Act, 
which would have required the EPA to consider only those studies with data that is publicly available in a manner sufficient for independent analysis and substantial reproduction of research results. Meaning, you and I, or some good scientist, would have to be able to not only look at the science and analyze it, but we'd have to be able to use that science to reproduce the results that were supposedly produced during the initial testing. He claimed that opponents of the regulation were often unable to audit the science underlying the regulations, although those opponents could, of course, have done their own science. Now, if you did your own science, and, and it doesn't say this here, but if you had gone out and said, okay, they said this happens, so we're going to pass this regulation. So we did our tests, and we came up with different results. What they're going to, the EPA wants to say is, well, well you didn't get to see the original science because we blocked you from seeing it, but what, what we say is, is that your science is, is different than our science, so therefore your science is invalid because that's not what we used to push this le this regulation through. Uh, and, and I was going to say legislation there on that, but it really is just a regula uh, regulation because the EPA doesn't care about legislation. They just pass any regulation they damn well please. And they try and say it's based upon some science, uh, even if they're hiding that science from you. The scientific community noted that this requirement would have the effect of excluding a lot of relevant science published in peer-reviewed journals. In particular, research on public health impacts of pollutants is the only possible is only possible through the use of confidential health data. Uh, there are systems in place to give researchers controlled access to that data, but releasing it to you and I, the public, is simply not an option. Why not? Uh, and doing so very well might violate other federal rules. That's why not. Uh, Smith couldn't get his bill through Congress, but he worked with former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt to get it rolling as an internal agency rule. In 2018, E&E &E News story reported that... Uh, engineering? I think... I don't know. I forget what it is. Anyway, this collaboration ran into an unlikely opponent the pesticide industry, which I would say that's a very likely opponent, not an unlikely opponent, but they call it an unlikely opponent, the pesticide industry. Those companies must provide safety studies when registering a new pesticide, so they were concerned about the cost of making all of their data publicly available. Really? Does it really cost you anything to make your data publicly available? I'm going to go ahead and say no, and you're lying. And they were unclear of what form it would take. Uh, the rule change was not finalized before Pruitt's resignation, and current EPA administration, administrator Andrew Wheeler appeared to take it back to the drawing board because, well, he works for some of those pesticide industries. Um, <laughs> but in a surprising <laughs> twist, a new draft has appeared, uh, that the New York Times described as headed for White House review. The twist is the new draft doesn't do much to refocus the rule in a more narrow way that minimizes industry obje objections. Instead, it has been made broader in some ways. So that would be good. Uh, everybody should have availability to, to this information to be able to see if, if they're, uh, quote unquote science is actually actual or not actually actual yes i said that the first version of the rule only covered the research that quantifies toxicity of things like pollutants and pesticides this draft removes that limitation epa is modifying the regulatory text initially proposed in the 2018 proposed rule it reads so that these provisions would apply to all data and models, not only those, uh, not only dose response data and dose response models. So, what's more, the rule is not just for new studies. It could end up applying retroactively. 
The draft contains multiple options and a couple, on a couple points, one of which is setting a date after which uh, research would have to comply with these requirements. But if that isn't uh, the option chosen, it would mean that all past research for which data has not been more, made more public, uh, this would, would be found to fail the test if a regulation comes up for renewal or updating the science on which it was based could then plausibly be excluded from consideration. It's, it's such a... They squirrel things around so much that you, you're not really ever positive or sure what they're talking about. Uh, anyway, in that, there is a link there um, uh, to the actual legislation. You can look, uh, cl click on it. It's, it's, it's highlighted in orange, Secret Service Reform Act. And um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, which you may want to, you may want to take a look and, and, and see, uh, be, because I think this is fairly important that that people at least have the opportunity to go through and, and verify when these regulations are being pushed down their throat, whether or not they're actually based on any real science, or it's just the EPA doing something in the name of the industries that are that are running them, uh, maybe maybe not. I don't know. Uh, to me, it seems fairly important, but uh, you know that, that's up that's up to you to decide. <laughs> my mouth is really dry today. What's what's my what's my humidity here? It's it's fairly humid. I shouldn't be this dry of a mouth. Oh well, I got water. Okay. <laughs> EFF dot org. Exactly, duh. Don't let science get involved with your belief systems. None of that stuff. <laughs> don't, be, don't be bringing don't be bringing facts into the matter. <laughs> All right. EFF dot org. Uh, posted on uh, November twelfth. Federal court rules suspicionless searches of travelers' phones and laptops, unconstitutional. Wow. Wow. The federal court actually said that was unconstitutional. But uh, before you stand up and cheer, it's not for you. They're not talking about you if you're traveling domestically. They're only talking about foreigners. <laughs> Anyway, the EFF pushed for this, and, they, and, and it happened. So here it is. In a major victory for privacy rights at the border, the federal court in Boston ruled Tuesday, or today, that day, the 12th, that suspicionless searches of travelers' electronic devices by federal agents at airports and other U.S. ports of entry are unconstitutional. The ruling came in a lawsuit Al-Assad versus McLean, uh, filed by the ACLU, uh, EFF, and ACLU of Massachusetts, on behalf of 11 travelers whose smartphones and laptops were searched without individualized suspicion at U.S. ports of entry. Oh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> This ruling significantly advances Fourth Amendment protections for millions of international travelers, not you, like I said, international travelers who enter the U.S. every year. Uh, according to Esha Brandrafi, or Bandari, staff attorney with the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, Project. by putting an end to the government's ability to conduct suspicionless fishing expeditions, the court reaffirms that the border is not a lawless place and we don't lose our privacy rights when we travel. This is a great day for travelers, international, who can now cross the international border without fear that the government will, in the absence of any suspicion, ransack the extraordinarily sensitive information we all carry in our electronic devices, said Sophia Cope, EFF senior staff attorney. The district court order puts an end to the Customs and Border Control 
CBP, how do you get bu customs, CBP out of Customs and Border Control, whatever, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, uh, asserted, asserted authority to search and seize travelers' devices for purposes far afield from the enforcement of immigration and custom laws. Border officers must now demonstrate individualized suspicion of illegal contraband before they can search the traveler's device. The number of electronic device searches uh, at the U.S. ports of entry has increased significantly last year. CBB conducted more than 33,000 searches, almost four times the number from just three years prior. International travelers returning to the U.S. have reported numerous cases of abusive searches in recent months. While searching through the phone of Zainab Merchant, that's really his name, okay, uh, a plaintiff from the Al-Assad case, uh, a border agent knowingly rifled through the privileged attorney-client communications. An immigration officer at the Boston Logan Airport reportedly searched at an incoming Harvard freshman's uh, cell phone and laptop, reprimanded the student for friends social media postings expressing views critical of the U.S. government and denied the student entry into the country following the search. So he does an illegal search. He doesn't like what the kid's uh, friends are saying and says, no, you can't come into the country. <laughs> but uh, the thing here is, and you need, you need to take this all with a sort of great assault because they say suspicionless searches uh, which means they could just say we suspect you of something uh, we, we think you were acting funny we didn't like the looks in your eye you had a funny smell to you you weren't standing up straight uh, you sneezed and it could be anything that they say gives them suspicion uh, about about you and so that because they have now suspicion they just have to come up with a reason. They can't uh, do it as a suspicionless manner if you're coming from outside of the U.S. In, if you're inside of the U.S., they can still search as freely as they want. Uh, <laughs> this, this does not affect that in any way whatsoever. Although they'll tell you, oh, no, we, we have a reason to do this. Uh, they, they, they really, I mean, they, they don't. <laughs> So, so there's that. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> I see Chloe's tuned in. Hey Chloe, how you doing out there? Uh, who else we got? We got Donna tuned in. We got um, Rob Works tuned in. Hey Rob. Yeah. All right. Okay. So cool, folks. All right. Going on. Continue on. Moving on. And we're walking. Oh, <laughs> Sputnik News. Sputniknews dot com. Uh, and, and, I, and I think this is stuff you all know already, but they're pointing it to the specifically uh, to the Bolivian coup, which obviously, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. I'll get to my thought that you don't know about that I'm going to get to in a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> Bolivian coup paves the way for U.S. offensive within Latin America, according to a Brazilian scholar. Bolivian unrest, driven by the dispute over election results, evokes strong memories of the January crisis in Venezuela and the 2016 removal of Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff which everybody wanted Dilma gone. I mean, be serious. But anyway, uh, says Brazilian scholar Gustavo Guerrero, outlining the U.S. role in the dis deposition of Morales. On November 12th, following, a num uh, follow following the President Evo Morales' resignation, opposition Senator Jeanine Anes, Anes, Anes uh, declared herself Interim president of Bolivia. She was the opposition, and she said, "Yeah, I mean, I'm the I'm, I'm the one now. It's me. Put the crown on my head." And on the next day, was recognized by the U.S. State Department. 
Now, let me stop here for a moment because, yeah, you see, this is how the U.S. works in these foreign countries. If the U.S. wants a certain leader of a certain country out of there because they're not playing the game the way exactly the United States wants them to, they force them out through getting a uprising of some sort or another within those countries. And in this one, uh, they did it through a, a coup, a military coup. Sometimes they do it just through uh, causing a revolution in a, in a country. Well, is what, what they're doing in Iran right now, uh, for example. Uh, you can look at that and, and study up on what's happening over there in Iran right now and understand where it's coming from. It's the same way they did in various other Middle East countries uh, that we all we all know about. Um, uh, because the United States, uh, the controllers of the United States who want everything to be done in a particular way, use the United States to go into these countries and, and stir up hate and dissension uh, against those people that aren't playing the game exactly the way that they want them to play it. And they'll, they'll push out a leader. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, just look over there, uh, and you'll, you'll understand. Those people aren't just out there in the streets waving American flags and, 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 and telling uh, the world that they want everything to be like America over there uh, for no reason. That, 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 that is definitely being pushed as well. But this is, this, like I said, this article is specifically, specifically about uh, what's happening down there in Brazil. So uh, he goes on to say here, uh, I want to express my sincere, <laughs> the, the U.S. government goes on to say, I, I, let me point that out here. The U.S. government goes on to say, I want to express my sincere congratulations to Jeannie Inez, the new president of the Pluridation State of Bolivia. Uh, that was Luis Fernandez, um, um, Luis Fernando. Camacho, one of the leaders of the Bolivian unrest, a millionaire and the head of the controversial paramilitary organization Santa Cruz Youth Union. Um, so where where did he get those words? Uh, how is she the new president, although she was the opposition leader uh, and loser of the election? <laughs> Evo Morales, who had been the president of Bolivia since 2006, resigned on 10 November after the country's armed forces and police joined the protesters who questioned the results of the 20 October general election. Yeah. <laughs> Addressing the nation, Morales and his vice president, Alvaro Garcia, Lenera announced that they would resign in order to bring an end to the unrest that has engulfed the nation since 21st of October. Following his resignation, Morales left for Mexico, where he has been granted political asylum. Washington used the same playbook in Venezuela and Bolivia. According to Gustavo Guerrero, executive editor of the scientific journal World Tensions, and a member of Brazilian Center for Solidarity with Peoples and Fight for Peace, the Sebrapaz. Uh, Bolivian right-wingers have deposed Morales using the same playbook that Washington tried to apply in Venezuela until now, unsuccessfully, and in Brazil beginning in 2014, when they, they finally got rid of Dilma, um, and culminating in the 2016 removal of President Dilma Rousseff, and the uh, arrest of another former leftist Brazilian president, Luiz Inacio Lual de Silva. These people have so many names. In April of 2018. Last week, the Radio Education Network of Bolivia, Herbal, leaked 16 audios in which alleged opposition leaders called for a coup against the newly re-elected president, Evo Morales, which was meant to be coordinated from the country's U.S. Embassy. <laughs> the names of the U.S. Senators, Marco Rubio, Bob Menendez, and Ted Cruz, were also mentioned in the leaks. Imagine that. Uh, the right-wing attacks on Bolivia were funded 
by the United States. Guerrero says they intensified after the presidential elections when Morales was re-elected with almost 48% of the vote. There is, in fact, widespread popular support for the president, but he is concerned by a growing wave of violent protests. The Brazilian scholar highlights the military and police militias who demanded that Morales step down played a major role in the Bolivian coup. The request was followed by a series of attacks by militias that set fire to the house of the president's sister and other members of the party, uh, the Movement for Socialism, Guerrero notes. However, according to the researcher, the military alone would not have been able to topple Morales without the backing of mass media and an uh, anti-national elite, a corrupt judiciary, and biased international institutions. On and on and on it goes. L O U L U La 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 La. All right, um, never mind. <laughs> Guerrero believes that what happens in the Andean country uh, is uh, far from being just an isolated fact. Foreseeing the, uh, the 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 coup in Bolivia will pave the way for further U.S. offensive within Latin America. It is part of a well-articulated set of interventions that try to take Venezuela from the elected government of Maduro, uh, suppress the de demonstrations of the Chilean people, impose an economic model on Ecuador, intervene in Argentina's political course, and take over Brazil, the main political and economic force in Latin America. He draws parallels, very easily by the way, uh, between the turmoil in Bolivia and the Venezuelan political crisis that started on the 10th of January 2019, but largely stalled despite the United States and its allies uh, hastily recognizing Juan Guaido, Guido as the country's self-declared interim president. I guess that's how it works down there in these countries, you know. You just declare yourself president during a turmoil, and, and then you're the guy or the girl, as long as you got the backing of the U.S. It... <laughs> All right. What do you all think of Steve Forbes? You know, he's, he's a rich guy, but he's kind of okay on certain things. I, he's an interesting character. Uh, he's the he's the guy, you know, Forbes magazine and Forbes dot com website. But he's he's pretty libertarian. He, he's pretty much a libertarian on a lot of things. I I, I kind of like him on on some of his his topics. Not on everything, by the way. Not not even close on everything, but uh, he he's all right in some things. And here you go here uh, by Steve Forbes himself. Uh, the war against e-cigarettes is profoundly wrong. This is also November 12th. You'd never know it from all the lurid headlines in recent months about the seeming epidemic of deaths from, quote, smoking, unquote, e-cigarettes. But vaping is actually a public health godsend for smokers. The hysteria surrounding vaping says far more about the peculiar fevers of our times, of our times, than about the realities of puffing e-cigarettes. Those deaths we hear about did not result from normal e-cigarettes, but from tainted contents, particularly the active ingredient found in cannabis, which is also incorrect information. It was not from the THC uh but from other additives thrown in the mix. Um, so, good but, but wrong, Steve. Um, anyway, uh, the, the cries for prohibiting vaping make no more sense than banning milk because a few bad characters peddled adulterated versions. The truth is that vaping is 95% less harmful than smoking. It lets users get nicotine, 
without all the other carcinogenic contents and carbon monoxide that comes from, from smoking cigarettes. Vaping is far more efficient in helping people quit inhaling tobacco than are all other props, including nicotine patches. Moreover, with many vaping devices, users can choose the level of nicotine they vape, including none at all. Uh, vaping has enabled countless number of smokers to give up cigarettes and countless others not to take them up in the first place, thereby saving millions of lives. In vivid contrast to those in the United States, British health authorities endorse e-cigarettes as highly effective means of enabling people to give up smoking tobacco. Which, by the way, people in the UK uh, are, are getting these weird lung things going on. <laughs> yeah, my brain's not always accurate. Uh, you can be sure of that. <laughs> I'm not really sure what he's talking about there, but, uh, oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, nonetheless, American politicians and government regulators, led by the FDA, are banning flavored e-cigarettes, claiming that they are designed to lure unwary teenagers to take up the habit. San Francisco, uh, that haven for drug addicts and people who shit on the sidewalks, has even banned the sale of vaping devices. The reality is that almost all vapes, there are about 11 million adult users in the U.S., prefer flavors to the taste of unflavored tobacco. For an epidemic in teenage vaping, there is little evidence e-cigarettes have become a gateway to cigarette smoking. Smoking among teenagers has, in fact, declined dramatically since the 1990s. Banning e-cigarettes, prohibiting flavored versions, or imposing draconian taxes, as a number of them idiot politicians in Congress and elsewhere are pushing for, would have two bad results. More people smoking traditional and highly lethal cigarettes and the use of black market markets for flavored e-cigarettes with all the risks of unsafe versions that would entail. So... Steve, get off the regulation bandwagon. Uh, just, just tell them to stay there. Stick, keep their noses out of it uh, altogether, from 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 point A to point Z, and uh, that'll help. <laughs> All right. Now we move on to the New York Post in November thirteenth, two thousand nineteen, here and. Um, they saw it, they found it, and they admitted it. They admitted it! But they don't have an answer. They don't have an answer. NASA detects oxygen changes on Mars. It's struggling to explain. Four months after the stunning announcement that NASA's Curiosity rover detected an unusually high level of methane on Mars, the government space agency said that oxygen behaves in a way that, so far, scientists cannot explain on the Red Planet. The Curiosity rover, which has been exploring the Gale Crater since it landed on Mars in August 2012, that's a long time, has been analyzing the air using a sample analysis at Mars, or SAM instrument. It found that the oxygen in the atmosphere did not behave in the same way that nitrogen and argon did. Uh, following a predictable season pattern, waxing and waning in concentration in the Gale Crater throughout the year relative to how much CO2 is in the air. Instead, the amount of oxygen in the air throughout the spring and summer rose by as much as 30% then dropped to levels that were predicted to by, by known chemistry in the fall. The pattern repeated each spring, through, uh, though the amount of oxygen added to the atmosphere uh, varied, implying that something, something or someone, was producing it and taking it away. 
<laughs> someone on Mars. Uh, the first time we saw that, it was just mind-boggling, uh, said the study's co-author in the statement. Uh, the study ha has been published in the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets. Uh, Mars' atmosphere is comprised of 95% carbon dioxide, 2.6% molecular nitrogen, 1.9% ar argon, and a mere 0.1%. Uh, 0.16% oxygen, 21% oxygen and 0.9% uh, argon and 0.3% carbon dioxide uh, are, are and trace amounts of other elements. What did you, what? Oh, that's Earth. <laughs> that's on our, I'm saying, what did you just, just contradict yourself? No, I, I just read wrong. Okay. Anyway, so uh, something's going on on Mars with the oxygen, even though it's just a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the atmospheric gases going on over there. And they don't know why. They don't know what's causing the rise or decline in the oxygen levels, uh, other than, you know, possible seasonal effects there. Um, so, something or someone on Mars... <laughs> All right. Now, this headline is fairly scary. But before I tell you about it, let me just say, unless you live in a specific place in upstate New York, this doesn't apply to you. Yet. <laughs> not that it won't soon. And not that they can't do it without this type of legislation. Because they do. But now there's legislation for people living in that small, specific area. New legislation will throw people in jail for disrespecting cops. Seriously. November 15th, theactivistpost.com. Matt Agarist. Albany, New York. In the land of the free, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution explicitly prohibits the government from abridging the freedom of speech. However, we've seen stu citizens pepper sprayed, assaulted, and arrested for their acts of free speech, showing just how little law enforcement cares about upholding the oath they swore to this very Constitution. Now, a new piece of legislation that is quickly passing through the legal process in New York goes one step further. If you annoy a police officer, annoy, whatever that means, a police officer in upstate New York, you could find yourself facing massive fines and even jail time. Seriously. In a vote this week, lawmakers in Monroe County Legislature passed a proposal in a 17 to 10 vote to fine and or jail a person who annoys, alarms, or threatens the personal safety of an officer. The jail sentence is up to one year and the fine is up to $5,000. According to the legislation, the anti-disrespecting applies to all first responders, not just cops. Naturally, those who have respect for the Constitution and freedom of speech in general are up in arms over the passage of such a tyrannical piece of legislation. As PIX11 reports, I'm on a bid with the New York Civil Liberties Union said it will have a chilling effect on complaints against police. Abid said she is also concerned over what the legislation could mean for communities of color. Members of the community have every right to challenge police officers, particularly those that engage in unnecessary behavior, she said in the statement. At, at, at a time when more accountability of police departments is needed, this law takes an incredible leap backwards. <sighs> Advocates for the tyranny, 
<laughs> advocates for the tyranny. Uh, is that a picture of Hans right there? Oh, <laughs> claim that it looks after those who look out for us. Yeah, they're really looking out for us. Because people need to be jailed if they talk back to a cop. The local law aims to crack down on behaviors of disrespect and incivility towards law enforcement and first responders in the hopes that these smaller incidents do not escalate. Oh, God. Just absolutely disgusting. Um, but the bootlickers love it. The bootlickers freaking love it. <laughs> As they they wear their back the badge thing while they're trying to fight off their gun confiscations or red flag permits <laughs> or whatever you call those things. Oh man, oh god. Anyway, speaking of uh, red flag type stuff, red flag type stuff, thefreesoftproject dot com. March 10th, 2018. So we're going way back for this one. Way back. Social services worker fired. Escorted out by cops for having a gun permit. Not a gun. A gun permit. She had a gun permit. A social worker took to Facebook and Twitter to share that she was fired from her job at a Roanoke City Social Services in Virginia and escorted from the building by three police officers, not because she came to work with a gun, but because her employer learned that she had a concealed handgun license. Storm Durham claimed that she went from working as a damn good social worker to being asked, which, you know, damn good social worker. I think that's an oxymoron right there, but, eh, take it for what it's worth. To being escorted out of a building, uh, or out by police, uh, who claimed that she was a safety risk to the building. Her announcement on Twitter received more than 15,000 retweets and more than 20,000 likes. Her tweet, I was fired today from Roanoke City Social Services. Serving as a damn good social worker. I was fired for having a concealed carry permit. Not the gun, the permit. I was escorted by three city police officers because I am a safety risk to the building. That was March 9th, 2018. Durham posted a longer version on Facebook in which she wrote that the same department that claims to be devoted to protecting children and families fired her because they found out that she had applied for a license to protect herself when she was not at work. <laughs> I could go on. <laughs> what now? Free sock? What are you talking about? Did I say something like that? I, I have no idea. I think anything about free socks. There are no free socks. <laughs> like there's no free lunch, there's no free socks. I, I don't know sock puppet. Um, <laughs> what you talking about? You try to confuse me? Well, that's not too hard to do. Okay, I, I have this major propaganda piece here, and and I, I put it in the list just so I could get to it. It's such absolute nonsense, but I saved it for last because the evidence is out there. And has been tested many, many, many times over. And has been stated by people all over the place that what these people are saying in this news study is absolutely inaccurate. But I, I wanted to bring it here and share it with you. Because to let you know that they are out there and they're trying to do bad things to you and folks like you. Because you like a plant. You like a certain plant. <laughs> All right, on the dailymail.co.uk, posted November 19th, well, a mere week ago, um, 
cannabis does not, not help people quit opioids. Let that soak in for a minute. Cannabis does not help people quit opioids, <laughs> despite hopes legalizing the drug would reduce U.S. addiction crisis. Study claims. Now, as we know, it does help. It helps tremendously. It helps a lot of people. And people state it over and over again that cannabis helps, helps them break the opioid habit. Researchers at McMaster's University, Ontario, reviewed six other studies. They found no evidence that cannabis could help people in addiction programs. Scientists hope legalization would reduce painkiller prescription in the U.S. of A. <laughs> All right. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. All right. So according to this lie, this massive lie, massive propaganda piece, anti-marijuana, anti-cannabis propaganda piece, medicinal cannabis is not effective at helping people come off powerful opioids, according to researchers. Marijuana advocates claim the drug can reduce people's reliance on the addictive painkiller drugs and even help addicts recover, only because it can and does and has and will continue to. <laughs> Scientists claim opioid prescriptions went down in states which legalized cannabis with suggestions it's just as good of a painkiller. Well, I don't know if those were suggestions of that, but saying that these people actually needed opioids in the first place could be your could be your mistake. Research has now debunked the unproven claims. <sighs> Liars, uh, with experts saying there is no proof using cannabis. Uh, anyway, I'm not. I can't even go on with this. It's, it's such absolute bullshit. Uh, I, I, it, you know. <sighs> I don't know who these people are working for, um, but they're working, obviously they're working for somebody, probably some big pharma company that produces opioids uh, that, that that does not want people to just say, hey, well, let me try some of that weed over there, that good stuff, and we'll see if I can break my habit of, of these freaking opioids, which are killing me, and smoke some of the good stuff, which will actually, actually benefit my health. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, like I said, I, I don't know who the people that did this study are actually working for, but they're liars, they're propagandists, and don't believe a word of it. Absolute nonsense. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's going to do it for me here today. Uh, this has been the Grim Leftovers program, um, episode fifty. 49, episode 49. Uh, I'll be back next week with episode 50. And um, I want you all to have a great week. Have a great turkey day if you participate in such things, which is Thursday. Thursday's turkey day. A lot of you get Friday off too. So, woohoo! Party! Four day weekend coming up. Yeah, babies! All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> enjoy that, everyone. Um, Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern is Flash Somebody and Mr. Easley <laughs> with In a Perfect World. Um, at this point in time, there's nothing on Wednesday, but I have hopes that there'll be a Wednesday show coming along soon. Anyway, don't don't pin me down on that. Don't try and nail. A lot of people come and say, hey, I want to do a show, but it never materializes. So we'll, we'll see what happens going forward. Um, Thursday evening, I, 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 again, I don't know, I don't know if Prince and Poopster will be on, as it is Thanksgiving evening, so they may decide not to come on, I don't know. They weren't on last week, but that was other reasons for that. Uh, but I will be, uh, uh, Vinny will be back on Friday with a ponder gander at 1 p.m. at 
1, yeah, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then uh, myself and the Moose Girl will be on Friday night, uh, that same Friday night, uh, with the Freakers Ball. So uh, everybody have a great week. Check the schedule on RLM Radio and RealLibertyMedia.com for all the rest of the shows. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm glad to have you all here as part of Real Liberty Media. Take it easy. Peace!